Welcome to week eight, the people of strategy. This week is actually split across, uh, well, this section of the marketing mix is interesting in that we split the two functions. We split people as employees and people as customers into two separate chapters so that we can explore the production side and the consumption side. Also with this week, we have some spoilers for the assessment task. Briefly, service blueprint, service profit chain, service gap model, and the service triangle. All elements of your second assessment task. All elements that will be useful for you to have a quick overview. So let's do a quick recap. Service blueprint, what it does. It is the map for customer contact with the staff. So a central idea here is contact employees. If you are looking at, yeah, you can use this for technology actions, but if you're looking at a very high touch uh, customer engages with the uh, company on a regular basis, personal interactions, it's a really good model. It's got a lot of strengths, but you have to be very aware that if you are doing the customer, so the line of interaction, the employee actions, if you've got a very low touch service, then there's not going to be a lot to, it's not going to be the best model. It can still be used, but there are other models that are better at the task. The service profit chain, which we introduce in week eight, this idea is around where there's a real value behind the employee. So if you think about the service blueprint, service blueprint is really focused from how does the customer interact with the firm? What's the customer centric view? What does the customer see, do, engage with? The service profit chain comes around the other side and says, what do we need to provide to have a good service? What can we do for our employees? So we start having things around, what's the role of the employee? How does the employee provide the service? If you have a highly automated, highly systematized and um, low human input service, service profit chain is less valuable to you. Your key in the service profit chain, what you're looking for is customer satisfaction, perception or reality, comes from value in the service chain, comes from the interaction between the customer and the employee, which is driven by the expertise of the employee and how well the employee can do their job, which in turn is based on internal service quality, which results in customer loyalty because it was a good service and they were satisfied and they liked the interaction, which leads to revenue and growth. Service profit chain works really well where you are going to be reasonably high levels of heterogeneity and you're also dependent on the interaction of your staff with your potential customer. Service gap model. This works really well when we start dealing with the concepts and ideas around service quality uh, for, and how we can influence the customer's perception of service. So the gap model is a, it comes up in Chapter 12, there are five elements to it. The service gap, the gap between what the customer ex expects and what the customer perceives. And that gap can be influenced through these other four aspects. The communications gap is the what you promise through your communications, through your IMC, through your advertising, and the service that you deliver. Your service that you deliver uh, and the standards that you specify, so this is quality assurance, is the gap three, where you have standards but they're not met in the delivery. Gap two is where you have a perception, an idea of what the customer expects, and you know what it is, but you just can't get it delivered. You, can't, you don't have the resources or the supplies or the equipment to make it happen. 
And gap one is where you don't know the customer expectation. You don't, so what you think the customer expects doesn't match what the customer expects so that that gap creates, no matter how good the service is that's delivered, it's not what the customer is expecting, therefore you're always going to have that gap. This model goes really well where you're looking to improve service quality, where you're looking to uh, improve a service. Also, where you're looking to control, perhaps offer a better version of the service. So you can influence, uh, you can create a whole new service product depending on how you tinker with the different gaps. Service gap, by the way, also sits alongside. There is a measurement scheme called SurfQual, and there is a quality assurance scheme called Rata. Service gap model is influenced by and influences those other two models, but they're not interchangeable and don't use them interchangeably. Service triangle, this is going to come up in the final chapter. This idea here is that there is a balance between the needs of the customer in the center and the role of the employees, the function of the service systems, and the overarching goal of the service strategy. How it works is that you have the capacity to move where the customer is located to any point within the triangle. So if the end result is you know, you've got a customer sitting up here, this indicates that you know, the interaction points aren't necessarily going quite well but it could be that the systems work really well. Uh, so what you have here is the, the different lines. The, the service strategy needs to be communicated. So this is basically the communication of the brand offering. It's the expression of the, what it is that the service does. Line two down the side is the idea of what you tell your staff. So the idea of the service strategy at the top here is that this is you know, the vision, mission, goal, and value offer. You communicate your value offer to your customer. Your customer's like, yeah, okay, I want a bit of that. But you also have to communicate your value offer to your employees. What is it that they are meant to be providing by being your employees? What's their role? What do they do? In order to do that role, they will need to interact with the customers, which creates this point notions of critical incidents or moments of truth. It's the customer service provider interaction. It's what happens when the customer and employee engage each other as the customer is trying to get a hold of the value offer and you are trying to provide it. Underpinning this is that employees need to be able to provide the value offer through the systems of the firm. So this is the idea of the organizational rules, regulations, but it's also the processes and procedures. It's the instruction manuals. It's the templates. It's how the service gets delivered. Lastly, up on the, the far side here is that having now established that we've got systems in play, the customer most of the time shouldn't be aware of service systems unless it's, you now if you were to locate a service down here, what you have is an automated system. High touch system is over here, uh, low touch, automated over here. In fact, low touch is probably in the middle there, automated there, high touch there. What you're looking at, in essence, is to what extent does the customer get engaged in the system themselves or the systems just sit around in the background and enhance the customer experience. And the final aspect, from service strategy to service system, you'd swear that this was something that's just like doesn't need to be said, but it's got to, the systems have to enhance the service encounter. It's very easy to create systems that are very good systems, but very bad at delivering services. <coughs> Wattle. Uh, there are ways and means for that 
to go wrong depending on what the initial purpose of the system is or was. So those are the, uh, the main models that are in the assignment. Let's dive into chapter eight and the content. So first principle for managing service workers is pay them. Do not be a celebrity chef in Australia. Just pay your workers. Principle one is pay them. Principle two is pay them more. And principle three is do not steal the wages of your employees. And if in doubt, pay them more and improve their conditions. Service workers are service providers. They are the heart, soul, and lifeblood of the service. And if they are not performing, and you are not, or if you are not performing for them, if you are not giving them the best opportunity they have to do their job well, you're not good at being a marketer. Fundamentally, it comes down to pay your staff, pay them well, give them the opportunity to get to produce good service products and then pay them more. So the big model of the week, uh, the service profit chain, we have mentioned that previously, but quite seriously, employee retention and employee productivity are the drivers that create the value. You do not have a service product with a service value if you do not have these facets. In a face-to-face -face delivery, you can't automate your way out of people being available. Someone has to create the product, someone has to conceptualize it, someone has to deliver it. Be good at it. Give them the money, reward them, make it valuable for everyone. All right, let's talk about a couple of the technical things. Every service employee is a boundary spanner. Uh, the idea of the boundary spanning is that you work for the organization and you deal with the customer. That's what a boundary spanner is. They have someone who, the boundary is the edge of the firm. It's a conceptual, theoretical, or metaphorical event. Someone who works on that edge will, by engaging with the customers, often need to take the role of advocate for the customer back to the firm. So you have this particular tension between the person whose job it is is to provide the service, their desire to provide something to the customer, and the rules and regulations under which they operate within the firm. So boundary spanning is, and fundamentally it's the job I do here at um, the ANU as a lecturer, I'm a boundary spanner because on the one hand, I'm the direct line of contact you have. On the other hand, I am supposed to also be the line of assessment, the line of teaching, learning, assessment, evaluation. So there's a tension between my roles. Now, a couple of the conflict areas, are the person role conflict where you are, these are really important things to be aware of. It is possible to have a very bad fit between a very high skilled person who is the wrong fit for their role. Now, I like doing the pre-recorded videos and I like doing the stand and deliver lectures. And I know a lot of my colleagues don't. So getting them to do, sit in a uh, room talking to a computer screen creates conflict. They like there to be another person. They like it to be dynamic. They like to, their improv, comedians of, in terms of their style, the way they work, they need to feed for, off the audience and interact with the audience. Whereas I'm all about the soliloquy and the monologue and more than happy to sit at my computer just talking to the screen and to the webcam on this because I assume there's someone out there listening. And if there isn't, it doesn't matter. Like, it'd be nice, but I don't have the need to immediate audience feedback. So the person role conflict thing is really important. If you're not a, not all of us are people people. Um, I'm good in a classroom, I'm good on close quarters, edu okay, I'm okay at close quarters education now, the stuff we've been doing this semester, but I really have never liked doing tutorials and I always preferred doing lectures. 
Whereas I know, again, the, the people who don't like to stand on stage and perform for a large audience, who are really good at the close quarters one-on-one -on -one stuff. There are people who are naturally driven to sales because they love interacting with other people and put them in a technical role behind the scenes away from the outside would be incredibly frustrating. So you've got to understand um, the conflict points. The second area, the inter-client conflicts, this is the really important idea is that other customers may or may not be compatible. Let's take, uh, well, one of my favorite incidents for this was being, going back to my um, late youth, uh, being at a goth nightclub in Brisbane, a room filled, like, they're playing Sisters of Mercy, um, the dance floor is filled with goths, and three guys in football jerseys walk in, and everyone's just having that moment of going, oh no, are they at the wrong place? Are they about to have a bad time? Or are we about to have a bad time? So the inter-client conflict just, as it turned out, they were goths, they'd just been, they were absolutely loving the club, they'd just been off to the football to watch their favourite sport that night. So there wasn't an inter-client conflict, but there was a moment between each of the customer bases going, is this the right person to be in the room with us? The other thing on the inter-client conflicts is that the boundary spanning staff are the people who are responsible for resolving conflict. If a fight's going to break out in a nightclub, the bouncer and the bar staff and the band are going to be responsible for solving the problem if it starts. Consequently, you need to make certain that these aspects, if you're running a service, get the right fit between your people. Someone who's good technically may be terrible as a salesperson and completely the wrong, and reverse. Great salespeople might be terrible um, technical people. Work to strengths, find the strength, but also working to strength requires you to respect each role having a specific skill set. And I cannot stress this enough. If you do not respect the skill set of a role, you will assume anyone can do it and you will create the dissatisfaction, frustration and high turnover rates. Which is also to case study one of the things at the university sector, and this is a sector-wide problem, is the idea that all of us are capable of going and selling the degrees during open day because we do small classroom teaching. The idea that you can easily interchange a good tutor or a good lecturer and say, oh, well, you deal with people and talk to people. You must be good at sales. Go sell the degree. So you've got to watch for this if you're not respecting it. Similarly, one of the things, are if you don't respect technical skills like administration, then you're prone to wanting to make administration a task done by any staff member rather than seeing it as a professional skill trait to be done by someone who's good at it. All right, the coping strategy section, um, I'm not saying it's an FYI guide to griefing your boss if your boss is a bit of a problem, but it's an FYI guide to griefing your boss if your boss is a problem. Well, take notes. Basically, one of the problems that you have is that if you create role stress conflict, to start with, if you've got people who aren't good with customers, they are going to avoid the customer. That's it. It's just, you're wasting your time using someone outside their skill set by putting them up against the customers. Alternatively, they'll just be like, how robot mode can I activate? Hello, welcome, can I take your order? It doesn't, it doesn't help. So you, you waste, again, your key is, the role is here to create the value for the customer. If you've put the wrong person in there, you're not going to get a value offering. Uh, I'm gonna mock this, by the way, this is one that I think is just, 
the silliest thing I've ever come across in a textbook. Welcome to room 1070 where I have physical symbols to increase my sense of control. Also, I have a lot of stuff that is related to my work in my room. Um, and I like my job and what I do and I'm a good fit to my role. That idea of exerting additional control through physical customization is a dumb idea and it should be ashamed of itself. Now, um, quick thing around the idea of, uh, look, it's late stage capitalism. There's no such thing as empowerment in a marketplace where you are not free to enter or exit the transaction and where you are threatened by uh, unemployment is a threat that can be used to keep you within a role that doesn't suit you because there's no choice, because there's eight people for every available job. So, basically, in this, let's not think about so much as empowerment as involvement. What is the level to which the customization is expected of you as a staff member? If you are in a high heterogeneity service, high inconsistency, high heterogeneity, then it's going to be high involvement because you're going to need to custom build each time. Versus you're in standardization, so production line mode, automation. Turning humans into bad robots is a bad idea. Turning bad robots into humans is a worse idea. Hum Some people are really good at routine tasks. And so they have a really good role fit. And if you've got someone like that, give them the opportunity to work the routine task. Uh, if you're now, one of the things about service scripts when we come up to this concept is I'm good with high involvement, high inconsistency. I'm, you know, I embrace the body chaos, and my whole catchphrase is. Uh, around the LEGO Serious Play, teaching creativity and flexibility is, well, teach flexibility, it's not like I can say I didn't plan for that. But also my LEGO Serious Play frameworks are incredibly nailed down and there is a very tight structure that I work in. So I have a production line orientation in these incredibly high involvement, high customization events. So you, that's the other thing, is that this linearity here is nice for the conceptual, but it's not how it works in practice. But the idea you want here is that the more consistent a service is, the more production line orientation it is, the less variance people are able to bring to their jobs because their jobs require them to stick within a certain framework. Pros and cons to it. Now the high involvement side is that you want to have the more customer services, the more likely it is that you're going to need highly skilled people doing a wide range of variable tasks and they will build up a body of internal knowledge around service provision. So the longer you can hang on to them and the better you pay them and the better you, you treat them, the better value you'll get out of your service organization. The low involvement teams, also, the production thing, the reverse of this is the faster, the better someone knows their job, the better they are at it, the faster they are at it, the more efficient they are at it, and the more effective they are at it. Ultimately, end of the day, treat your staff well, treat, pay them well, don't steal their wages, and look to fit the right people to the right role. Use your marketing. Marketers have a better ability to look at a scenario and a situation and a group of people and say, where do you best fit? Where could I make the best opportunity for you to match your skills against the challenge of the job? Use that mindset, find the right fit, pay them well. That's how you do well in services marketing. People drive the process, people deliver the product. They are the source of value and they are also people that are inherently valuable and should be valued. All right, so the exam prep question. 
Look, for all of you who were in the classroom who looked at this and went, there's no way he's going to provide that to us. Little faith, people. I know you don't have a lot of faith in us, but please, try. So, this question, context A and context B, you're going to be given the context in the exam question. So anything that's blocked out in the square, brackets is going to come to you, will be released to you when you see the exam question. Reusable knowledge one and reusable knowledge two, if you've been paying attention to either SA1 and or SA2, you might spot what could be the reusable knowledge. But basically, you're going to get a context, and that context is going to ask you to be, or what this question is asking you to do is, in light of a specific strategy that can be used to improve a specific outcome, How do these two contexts, how do one or other of these two contexts apply? You'll see the question, you look at the question, it's application. It's not about simply recalling and repeating everything you know, it's about using it, it's about creating. So this exam question, the whole services exam embodies co-production, create the solution to the question on the page in the environment for which you have been provided. So work with it, do what you can. Uh, the question context, these question frameworks are being provided to enable you to have the best opportunity in the room. I want people to do well in this exam. I want people to produce good answers to the questions. So I'm setting up the most enabling framework I can do without upping the difficulty level of the marking. So, as I said, it's gonna be here. These questions are up, they're live, <coughs> they're real. And also somewhere on the campus, there is a copy of the exam. It is a tradition to place it out in the field somewhere. Um, so that if it can be found, congratulations, you found it. And that's a wrap on week eight.